Good evening and welcome to our audience, both here in the Brubeck Room, as well as those participating virtually. I'm Elaine Ty Loria, Executive Director of Wilson Library. This evening's program is an interview about the storytellers written by Wilton's own Dr. Mark Rubenstein. Just a few words about the format for this evening's program. At the end of the conversation, there will be a question and answer portion. Time permitting, Mark will answer as many questions as possible. For those of you watching virtually, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I would like to thank Elm Street Books from New Canaan for being a sponsor and also being here this evening. <laughs> Copies of the storytellers are available for purchase here and Mark will be happy to sign them for you. Many thanks to Elm Street Books and Manda for your continued support. Please note, a portion of the proceeds from the book sales will go to our library, so thank you in advance. And now a bit about our presenters. Dr. Mark Rubenstein is a physician, psychiatrist, and an award-winning author of what's referred to as high-octane thrillers. Among his works are Mad Dog House and its sequel, Mad Dog Justice, both of which were finalists for the Forward Book of the Year Award. Another of his works, The Lover's Tango, won the gold medal in popular fiction at the Benjamin Franklin Awards. Mark has also been a contributor to the Huffington Post, Psychology Today, he's a book reviewer for the New York Journal of Books, and he also contributes columns to Literary Hub's Crime Reads. For over five years writing for the Huffington Post, Mark had the opportunity to ask some of the most well-known mystery and thriller authors questions about their inspirations in writing. The Storytellers is a compendium of their thoughts, anecdotes, and candid opinions. Moderating the discussion is well-known Wilton resident, writer, and filmmaker, Megan Smith Harris. Megan is the founder and executive director of the Fairfield Film Festival. She's also an award-winning writer and playwright, speaker and interviewer, and a film festival judge. Her career also encompasses documentary, television, film, theater, and magazines, as well as radio. So it's truly a pleasure for us to host these two incredibly multi-talented Wiltonians who are also very special friends of our library. Thanks again to everyone here and virtually for joining this evening's conversation. Now, please join me in a warm welcome for our presenters. And I, I just want to add a very big thank you to Wilton Library, Elaine Tyloria, and all the people who work here um, for pulling this event together. It is so nice to be doing a live event, to see faces, albeit only half of them uh, in the audience, uh, and to know that those of you who are at home can participate as well. So many thanks for setting this up. And uh, as usual, uh, we have not, uh, yet another gem in the Wilton community um, who is uh, providing us with great entertainment and uh, wonderful books to read. Um, so, you know, the fact that you're a psychiatrist and what was a psychiatrist professionally for many, many years and then transitioned into writing, it seems like the perfect background to become a writer of suspense and thriller <laughs> novels. So how, how does that serve you in writing your own books? Well, to understand human behavior, I, I, I think fiction is really the truth that's written as a lie. If you want to read lies, just read memoirs and autobiographies. <laughs> uh, my training as a psychiatrist sort of fell by the wayside. I think I just internalized some of it. And uh, my own interest in other people and in, in what being human is all about, that's what really fiction is all about. Because at the heart of every work of fiction is conflict. Without conflict, 
without people at odds with each other. There's virtually no story. I'll quote David Mamet on that when I interviewed him. He said, if Hamlet's father isn't dead and Hamlet comes home from school and his father asks him, how was school today? <laughs> and Hamlet says, it was great, dad. Well, it's boring. There's no story there. But if Hamlet's father is dead and Hamlet believes that his uncle killed his father and is sleeping with his mother, then you've got a story. You've right. got conflict. Then it gets interesting. Yeah. It's a whole different ball game. And what was it the two authors, one was talking about how if you have a cup in the middle of the table, do you remember that? Yeah, well, yeah, it, fiction, at least suspense thriller fiction, always involves people living on the edge. It's, as Cormac McCarthy said, it's the fiction of mortal events rather than the dissatisfied uh, bourgeois living in Westchester County or Connecticut. Right. It's, it's something uh, that it's, it's humanity in extremis. And to illustrate that at one point, uh, Michael Connolly took a glass of water and it was sitting in the middle of the table. He said, that isn't very interesting, is it? And he slowly began pushing that glass of water toward the edge of the table and says, now I've got your attention, don't I? <laughs> so when people are living on the edge, when their lives are threatened, or when a crime has been committed and a family has been devastated, and when people are at their wit's end and trying to deal with the trauma of what crime can do, there's not only suspense, but there's the view that the reader has of humanity, of human beings in extremis. And that, that's, that's why the number one selling genre, if you look at the New York Times or any other bestseller list, at least six, seven, or eight of the top 15 books are suspense thrillers. And let's talk about that. There's a difference between suspense, thrillers, and mysteries. And you laid this out for me. And I, I guess I just never really thought about it, but it made so much sense. So let's talk about that. Okay, well, you know, suspense should be in a mystery, a thriller, or, or uh, uh, a, 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 a suspense thriller. Uh, the different, most people don't think about it, that a mystery is usually an elaborate construction by the writer, where it usually begins with either a murder that's been committed or that is about to be committed and happens. And then the reader follows the detective or the investigator, through a puzzle and certain hints are dropped by the writer and eventually the mystery is solved. That's in marked contrast to what a suspense thriller is. A suspense thriller, number one, you have a protagonist whose life, well-being and or liberty are all up in the air. You don't know what's going to happen. The clock is ticking and the, the, the essence of, of a suspense thriller is that the protagonist has to overcome some kind of antagonist in order to not only survive, but to go on, if it's a series, to go on to the next book, if it's a standalone novel, to get through that novel, and hopefully by virtue of the extremis through which he's been put or she's been put, that person has grown and his or her life has changed, hopefully for the better. Well, what I loved about the storytellers is that, uh, you know, there's four, 46, right? 46, 46 authors. authors. And obviously I knew a handful of them and have read their books, but it introduced me to all sorts of other writers that I didn't know about. And I plan to use this as kind of a, a little, you know, shopping list for when I'm like, oh, I'm in the mood for something. And then I can open the book and sort of see what I feel like reading. Mm -hmm. and, and it has opened me up to a lot of, uh, a lot more authors. Also, all the different subgenres were so interesting to me. All the different types of, you know, domestic thrillers and oh, uh, don't leave out noir, noir, noir thrillers, right? Suburban thrillers. Suburban you mentioned thrillers. domestic thrillers, yeah. international spy thrillers. Um, uh, oh, there are at least five or six others that I'm just blocking out right there now. There was even a Western. There, there are Western thrillers. Right. Uh, Romance. We th there are urban thrillers. Right. There are romantic thrillers. Uh, Jane Ann Krantz writes romantic thrillers under three pseudonyms. I'd heard of Amanda Quick as one of them, right? Amanda Quick. I'd heard of that, them, yeah. but I she had yeah three different ones, which was uh, oh, oh, interesting. She, she, so, um, so tell me, I mean, how much fun was 
writing this or pulling it together. I know you did the interviews over a number of years for HuffPost and then you kind of thought, hey, there's maybe there's a book in this. So talk to me about the process of being an author, interviewing other authors um, and how, you know, what, what do you enjoy most about it? Well, first of all, uh, I, I was really amazed at how open and giving all of these authors were, uh, without exception, even David Mamet, although he gave me a little bit of a tough time on the telephone. Um, but they, they were really very giving, very open, and uh, expressed themselves uh, about their creativity, their hangups, their fears, um, their processes. The thing that really struck me was that the same worries, concerns that I, basically a nobody in, in, in comparison to this pantheon of authors, the same fears and worries that I have, almost every one of them has, namely, where will my next idea come from? Can I do this again? Uh, uh, Joseph Finder says that when he's beginning a new novel, he says, I, I'm not equipped for this. How did, how did I do it last time? I can't, and his wife says, you say this at the beginning of every book. <laughs> and, and he does, and yet he finds the way, and as do many of the authors, the, the, the novel tends to grow organically as they're going along, and it gets done. And then when the next one comes along, I'll, I'll never forget when Ian, I was sitting with Ian Rankin and, um, Peter James at Thriller Fest in New York City. And we, the three of us had this wonderful conversation. We did more laughing than talking, but Ian Rankin said, you know, being a writer is not, I, I always thought it would be like being an auto mechanic. After you've taken apart enough engines, you, you know how to do it. It's not a big deal. Yeah, there are little minor differences between different models, this, that, and the other thing. But each time I begin a new novel, it's a whole new thing. I, I'm not sure I can do it. And I found this to be an almost universal constant amongst all these authors. I, I found that so interesting because I noticed that through line as well and how insecure some of these incredibly famous people are who, who have like a hundred million books in print and they, are, are, they get kind of insecure. And a lot of them talked about the midway through the novel um, is when they really feel lost and like it's terrible and whoever thought they could be a writer and that they've lost mm -hmm, it and mm -hmm. writer's block. And uh, so it was actually reassuring in a lot of ways because, you know, those of us who do write and aspire to do more, it was kind of encouraging because, you know, you're not the only one who struggles and that doesn't mean you're not a good writer. It just means mm -hmm. you're you're growing and evolving the story. It's part of the process. Lisa Gardner says in the book, I've learned to grow comfortable with my discomfort, with the anxiety. I've, I've gotten used to it. Uh, she also says uh, her, her daughter is at the age now where her friends are reading Lisa Gardner's novels and she's worrying that her friend's parents won't let her friends come <laughs> to the house ladies. anymore because this <laughs> insane woman writes these stories. She must be sick in the head. Well, let's, in talking about creativity, um, there was something from Patricia Cornwell you wanted to share oh, with yeah. us. So um, where creativity springs from. When I last spoke with uh, uh, the interview with Patricia Cornwell, uh, I think there were three of them and I sort of integrated them into um, one mm -hmm chapter uh, but uh i i asked her what does question what does writing novels do for you emotionally she answered i love the way it keeps me company i find no matter what's going on in my life i don't have to wait on somebody else to give me satisfaction i can sit at my desk open something i'm working on and be transported to the same world i want to take the readers as a child writing was my best friend it made me feel less by myself. I think being on this planet is a lonely experience and without imagination, it's very isolating. For me, writing has been a gift. Creative expression is a great coping mechanism if you're sad, scared, or lonely, much as I was as a child. Writing was my retreat, the thing that healed my soul and touched those parts of me nothing else could had to come from within myself. If you can reach inside yourself and create something, a painting, a drawing, a book, music, that's for Mr. Brubeck over there, it can be healing and very life affirming. 
I think it not only demonstrates something about Patricia Cornwell, but this is somewhat emblematic of how open these authors were with me. That Truly. they would talk about their emotional lives, their wives, their husbands, their children, their divorces. Uh, I, I was astounded to go back to your earlier question, you know, uh, what was, uh, what did I enjoy? What did I find interesting? Uh, how open these people mm -hmm. were was just uh, amazing to me. I don't know if I could be that open. Uh, well, I, I guess we'll have to find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the other things Patricia Cornwell talked about was how she um, she walks and uh, that, you know, people, this always amazes me too. When I do go for a walk, you know, I don't listen to music. I, I don't have my phone. I just am present. And she talked about the importance of being present because, uh, that's how you're engaging all the senses. And she also talked about how that kind of, you know, hard drive is going on in the background, which many of the authors talked about, mm -hmm. that sometimes uh, you have to just let things go and trust that that process is gonna be there and, and will answer the next day when you sit in front of your computer screen. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, a number of them, I'll tell you, uh, Sue Grafton said that her companion when she writes is really shadow. And she said, yeah. she went on to talk about the fact that shadow is really a Jungian concept uh, that's a, equivalent to the unconscious in Freudian terms. And that shadow speaks to her. And sometimes she's 150 pages or 15,000 words into a novel and realizes that a shadow is talking to her and saying, this is not working. Yeah. And she dumps the novel. It's very hard for a writer to do. Um, almost every one of them mentioned something about working up to that creative moment when things start to come together. Uh, almost all of them at times write themselves into a cul-de-sac and don't know how to get the protagonist out of the hole they've dug them into. Uh, talk about walking. Patricia Cornwell, uh, Lisa Gardner uh, also is a big hiker. She hikes all through New Hampshire in the woods near her home. And uh, I can tell you that scientifically, when you are engaged in exercise, such as walking, there is a dilation of the arteries in the brain, and there's a greater perfusion of oxygen in the brain. Hence, the, 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 the raw material can mm -hmm. flow more easily, and with the perfusion of oxygen, of blood-filled oxygen, there can be more of that creative spark. So some of these writers really feel that they have to uh, get out and go for a walk or tramp through the woods. Um, Patricia Cornwell also scuba dives and flies helicopters. Yes, she does. <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> and there was somebody else who had a had their own plane as well. Oh yeah, Stuart Woods has right. his, uh, a Cessna. He flies it all over, and he's the one who only writes one hour a day. One hour a day from, from eleven from, till noon, right? And he and he produces four novels per year. Okay, I said, well, how do you uh, how do you do that? He said, well, uh, you know, uh, I have a vivid imagination. Um, I didn't get married until I was forty seven, <laughs> so uh, he had time on his right. hands. And um, uh, when I asked him, uh, how can you do this in one hour a day? He says, well, I just do it. I do it for one hour. He does a chapter a day, wow. and at the end of thirty days, he has thirty chapters, and at the end, it takes him three months to do a book. And hence four books a year. That's kind of shaming me a lot because I'm thinking like, who it among us me. cannot afford an hour a day for our art, whatever it is. In contrast, uh, James Rollins says, I'm a slow writer. I can only do about 1,500 words in a day. That, that's max. Uh, same thing with uh, Lee Child. Right. I can only, I, my, a great day for me is 1,500 uh, right. words. Uh, a more regular day is 1,200 words, but James Rollins says, um, it takes me an hour to an hour and a half to just do one page double-spaced in writing. Right. And he had intended to just write one book and he wanted to have the thrill of walking into a bookstore and seeing his book on the shelf. <laughs> and 23 or 26 novels later, that thrill has been compounded. Um, talking about the writing life and what they would do if they weren't a writer, you asked a lot of uh, authors oh, that. Yeah, yeah. And I think Harlan Coman uh, had, oh, yeah. Harlan, had something. 
Arlen Coben is a, a very interesting guy, uh, played college basketball. He still plays basketball and he's now 50 something. He's a huge guy. And uh, among other things, I, I said, are you accosted in, in, um, in public because you're a very a unique looking guy? He said, nah, I enjoy anonymity like most writers do. Uh, the one who get the, the most recognizable writer, of course, is Stephen King. Yes. But, um, um, Harlan, Scott Turo too. Uh, Scott Turo, yeah. yeah. Harlan Coben said that one part time he was sitting on a plane between two passengers, um, and they were each reading one of his books, and <laughs> neither one recognized them at all. <laughs> that kind of would have killed me a little bit. I would be like, uh, "Do you like that part where that?" <laughs> his picture is only on like eighty six million right. book flaps. You know, yeah. maybe if he makes it to ninety, though, uh, well, get more uh, recognition. I asked Harlan Coben, "What do you love about the writing life?" Answer, I think the short answer would be, what don't I love about it? There's no downside for me. I guess I'd rather not have to do so much traveling and writing never gets easier. It always torments you. There's that insecurity, the feeling I'll never be able to do it again. And this is when I talked with him, he had about 66 million copies in print in 130 countries. Unlike some other jobs, you can never for a second just show up. You really have to work at it. And you find yourself feeling some doubt with the beginning of each new novel. But really, for me, there's very little downside. And I love what I do. It's been a dream come true. So I followed up and asked him, what would you be doing if you weren't writing? I have no other marketable skills. I'm disorganized forgetful and easily distracted. I don't know what I'd be doing. Frankly, that's part of what makes me a writer. Writing is a form of desperation. <laughs> Most writers aren't capable of handling a real job in society. This is all we have. So this is what I do. Um, I also loved, uh, I think it was Lisa Gardner who was uh, talking about when she wrote her first book, do you oh, want yeah. to share that story? She wrote her first novel at age 17 and it was published when she was 20. So I said, well, what made you write a novel at 17? Her answer was, I didn't know any better. <laughs> um, when, when her uh, book came out three years later, uh, she had bought Writer's Digest and she'd followed all the instructions and she did whatever had to be done. And eventually uh, the book didn't sell, it, it sold a few dozen copies, whatever, but she thought she would um, uh, make a lot of money. So she uh, went out looking for a new computer, a new laptop. Well, she whatever. told everyone she was going to buy a Mercedes. Uh, a Mercedes, right, right which, uh, <laughs> which she couldn't do. And so she bought a new laptop with the money she received in royalties, but she had to pay for half of it with her own money. <laughs> <laughs> and wait for it to go on sale, too. Right, right. <laughs> so, right. Um, so a lot of the authors also talk about channeling certain, their personality and some of their characteristics into their characters. Uh, can you give me some examples of, of that? You had some- Yeah, well, I, I said, well, how much of Lee Child is in Jack Reacher? He, he, well, he said, well, you know, we all bring parts of ourselves into the, uh, uh, into the protagonist. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Jonathan Kellerman said that uh, the writer is in every single character he or she writes uh, to one or another extent. Um, when I, I said to Lee, well, I said, Lee, you're, you're the exact height of Jack Reacher. You're six foot five. He said, no, I'm only six foot four. I do what most male writers do. I make my protagonist one inch, one inch taller than I am and a lot more muscular than I am. <laughs> Women writers make their protagonists have better hair and thinner thighs. <laughs> he also says, I love being in the publishing world because I work with women and like Jack Reacher, I love women. <laughs> And he also says that he smokes weed to write. He smoked, he smoked. Since 1969 been, or something? He, he's been smoking cannabis since 1969. I asked, do you, do you write while you're you know, smoking cannabis? He says, not really. I revise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, other authors, some authors write to music as well. Yes. Um, well, Don Winslow, who's a good friend and uh, an incredible uh, stylist of prose, 
um, when he's writing an extremely violent uh, action filled scene, will play hip hop and let the anger seep through him and go right through to his fingers and tapping away. Uh, and when he's writing something that's more mellow, he'll listen to a, uh, a Charlie Parker or, or, or a, uh, uh, a slow, soft jazz uh, selection. Um, John Coltrane. Uh, John Coltrane. <laughs> um, the, the, um, who was it? Somebody told me, um, uh, I, I forget, uh, a, a number of people listen to music. Oh, um, uh, Michael Connolly. Uh, writes all the time listening to jazz, but he cannot listen to vocals because they'll interrupt his uh, train of thought. So he he puts in his earplugs and he listens to jazz and he writes exclusively to jazz. And if you watch Bosch on TV, you'll notice that there's a constant uh, stream of, of jazz playing in the back, almost right. constant. Right. Right, right. And that's because Connolly, who, who got involved with the television end of things, right. insisted that um, have that, kind of a soundtrack too. That, that it's on the soundtrack, and that the that the TV show, and he talked about this with the showrunner. It has to reflect uh, uh, Michael Connolly's and hence uh, Hieronymus Bosch's love of jazz. Right, right. So you know. I wanted to talk a little bit about revising. Uh, C.J. Box talked about the role his wife and children played in, mm -hmm. in helping his books, that the kids helped point out phrases that would just be totally lame if somebody used it and corrects the way he writes texts and stuff. And I know that your wife um, helps you in with your uh, revisions. Absolutely. Why don't we uh, give uh, your wife a little shout out here and can you tell me what she does for you? Well, in terms of this book, uh, after I uh, interviewed these people and I put the interviews together or even after I did one interview and before I went on to the second or third with the same author, she would edit them. I, I would edit them very severely because I recorded the, the interviews, uh, whether it was in person or over the phone or what have you. Uh, then she would edit them uh, so they read something like English for me, and then uh, we would both refine them. In terms of my own writing, uh, I've never, I, as I, I've just finished a novel and I've sent it off to the publisher. And um, as part of the acknowledgement, I, I said, Linda, I, I, I touted all her talents and I said, she's rescued every novel I've ever written. But she, you also had told me there are quite a, a laundry list of uh, things she she does for you in terms of oh grammar what, and line oh, editing grammar and, line editing and uh, punctuation and and uh, inconsistencies. She went to a, a a very rigorous Catholic school and they and she <laughs> and she 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 can she learned Latin and she knows all the roots and she does whatever she has to do to make it read better. Uh, I found it very interesting about James Rollins that he still belongs to a writer's group mm -hmm. and uh, the same one that he belonged to before he published anything. Absolutely. And takes his books uh, to this writer's group. He, he does. He takes his script and he, he prevails upon these. I think there are 11 people in the group and they go through his script and they tear it apart. And he said, basically, they keep me honest. There are times when he said, I get lazy and I, uh, I think, well, this is good enough. But uh, by the way, he says his claim to fame is not that he's on the bestseller list. He's a <laughs> he was a veterinarian before he did anything mm -hmm. else. He said, my claim to fame is not that I'm on the bestseller list, but that I can neuter a cat in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and talking about throwing stuff out, Sue Grafton um, said that she had written seven novels before yes. she published and what happened with those novels? Uh, only four and five saw the light of day. The others, uh, as she said, thankfully have uh, gone to the way of all things. I can't uh, even fathom writing that many books and not having them. I mean, the tenacity is really kind of the, the other theme that runs through. They yeah. just don't give up. The, 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 the perseverance of some of these people, I mean, uh, Patricia Cornwell, who I know spoke here at the Wilton Library a, a few years ago uh, and has sold millions and millions of books. I mean, she she said, you have to have faith in yourself. You have to uh, be willing to write badly before you can write well. And she said, if, if rejection defines me, 
then I am a nobody because she was rejected again and again. She even tells a story about her first um, novel that got published, it was called Postmortem. And she went to a bookstore to speak and she didn't realize it at the time, but it was a Christian bookstore. So <laughs> she, <laughs> Ruh -ruh. No, nobody came and one woman uh, saw her sitting there and gave her a tissue, said, will you dispose of this for me? Oh my God. Yeah. So oh. talk about not in, not being invited to the dance. Uh, she uh, she was rejected many times. Many of these authors were. Who was the most uh, surprising author you spoke to? Mm. Oh boy, I, I'd have to say, well, I wasn't surprised by Don Winslow, which was just uh, such a great, fun-filled interview because he and I had had lunch together many times, and uh, we went off on all kinds of tangents, some of which I had to cut out of the the uh, uh, the script. Um, although he gave me a rough time, I'd have to say I had a lot of fun with uh, David Mamet. Mm -hmm. I had uh, great fun with... Uh, Lisa Gardner, she told me a story about how uh, when she was waiting on tables in a Greek restaurant, they had something called flaming saganaki, which was some <laughs> kind of cheese that they poured brandy over and lit on fire. And at least a number of times her hair caught on fire and she got what she called pity tips because <laughs> of that. And she was, she is just a very, she's a firecracker of a, of a, uh, of an individual just is filled with anecdotes and good humor. I would, I'd have to pick uh, those three, Mamet, uh, uh, Winslow and, and Gardner were a lot of fun. Now, when you started writing your own books, um, you hired a, uh, an acquisitions editor or former acquisitions editor to help you with your own books. So let's talk yes. a little bit about that because you learned some important lessons from her. Yes, I did. Um, she, I, I, my first attempt was um, uh, very flawed. And she said, well, you know, when you're writing a suspense thriller, you have to think of uh, the writing, you should be showing, not telling. Show, don't tell is a big mantra amongst thriller writers. In other words, don't say he walked into a beautiful or well-appointed room, but describe the room without going overboard. Uh, the other mantra that she told me, she said, your writing should reflect action, dialogue, and description. Those three elements should be foremost. If you're writing anything other than action, dialogue, or description, you're writing an essay. You're not writing a novel. And um, I found that very helpful. I, I was walking around all day going, action, dialogue, ADD, attention deficit <laughs> disorder, ADD. And but it's, a, it's great. It's a checklist when you go back and you're, am I doing these three things? I'm not. What do I have to cut? Believe it or not, someone as skilled and as brilliant and as successful as Dennis Lehane said, he has to go through a novel two, three, four times to make sure that he's showing, not telling. Hmm. I'm reading a novel right now um, that has so much telling in it, it, it's really like reading a travelogue. Really? Or, or an essay, and I, I find it very off-putting. I don't know if I'd have found it the same way years ago before I be, began writing on my own and, be, and, and took to heart what this acquisitions editor told me. So this is also, I'm sure, it has to be a great learning experience for you as well. What are the lessons you've learned from all these famous uh, authors who sell millions of books worldwide? I learned that they have the same problems that I do when it comes to writing. Many of them do. Procrastination is one of the big ones. Scott Turo says that he is amazed at how often he finds his head in the refrigerator <laughs> because it's the farthest place from where his computer sits. And uh, this is very common, a procrastination. Um, uh, writing is really rewriting. That's another thing I learned. 
a friend of mine named Diana Chang years and years ago, long before any of this began, maybe 35 years ago, uh, who was a writer, uh, wrote literary stuff, said writing is really rewriting. And that's another theme that comes in revision, rewriting. Um, I, I learned that. I learned that um, these people are all as vulnerable as anybody else you'd ever meet. Uh, fame has the... When you talk to someone like David Morell, the father of Rambo, whose first novel in 1972, First Blood, came out. And of course, since then, there's been the Rambo movie franchise. I mean, he, 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 he's made probably a half a billion dollars. Uh, uh, when he talks about his childhood, his father died in World War II. His mother had to put him in an orphanage for a while. Oh. He got out of the orphanage when his mother remarried, but she remarried a man with whom she didn't get along. They had terrible fights. David used to hide under the bed and cover his ears so he didn't hear the fighting. And he made up stories to try and get himself through this, what was for him a traumatic incident. On top of that, he talked about the fact that when he eventually got married and they had a son, at the age of 14, his son died of Ewing sarcoma. And then 22 years later, his 15 year old granddaughter died of the same disease. So he says, if you read my novels in succession, what you see is an autobiography of my life wow. and of my firm belief that everything can go to hell in a handbasket in a moment. And that's also what thrillers are all about. One mistake that one person makes in a moment in time this is something Andrew Gross does tremendously. He gets stopped by a cop for an innocent traffic infraction. He rolls through a stop sign. And that leads to an unbelievable sequence of events that constitute a thriller. And so I, I learned all of these things. And, and you know, I learned by osmosis, by just mm -hmm. listening and talking and exchanging, going to lunch with uh, uh, Don Winslow and, um, going to dinner with, with uh, Simon Toyne and John Land and um, David Morell. I mean, uh, they talk about writing, they talk about their problems, their difficulties, the publishing industry, and, and you just you learn by seepage. <laughs> learn by seepage, okay, I can remember that. Uh, people often ask where authors get their ideas. Um, mm. I think you had that's some the most, ideas on that. That's the most frequent question that's asked of a number of the authors. Where do you get your ideas from? And I can only quote Arthur Miller, who when asked, where do you get your ideas from, said, if I knew where that was, I'd go there every day. <laughs> the, the bottom line is that almost anything can be the uh, fountainhead for an idea. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, years ago, I had a patient, he was from Brooklyn, and he looked like he was from Brooklyn. He had the slick back hair and he wore the gold necklaces and everything. And he um, wore very, very fancy uh, clothing, uh, very slick back sort of guy. And in our third, he had problems with his father. His father was a very dictatorial guy and he came to talk to me about, he, he got my name just at random out of, back then out of the yellow pages or, or the white pit, whatever. And in the third session, he comes in and he says to me, you want to know who clipped, oh, what was his name? I've forgotten the name. Honey, what was the name? Carmine Galenti. Carm Carmine Galenti. Carmine Galenti was shot outside a, uh, a restaurant in Brooklyn by another, by, uh, he was trying to take over the Gambino mob family. And do I wanna know who, sh who clipped Carmine <laughs> Galenti? And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> and then I thought about it after, and then he goes on, and he talks about his father and this and that. And I realized he was the son of a kingpin mafios. Yeah. And I'm treating this guy. And what does his father think? This kid is telling me, the kid, he was 30 years old. What is he telling me? And what does his father think he's telling me? And what, is, what do his other friends think he might be telling me? And what do I know? 
and could I become a liability to their mob activities? So I had a, I terminated the treatment with him. And you know, years later, I'm watching The Sopranos, and Dr. Melfi is in the same situation, except she continued on with Tony. Um, anyway, that became the nidus for a novel that I I I'm working on right now. It's called The Disappeared. So a psychiatrist has to disappear. Mm. And you have a, another book, Assassin's Lullaby. Assassin's Lullaby. And what, yeah. it, tell us a little bit about that, and, or if you can. Well, I, I, yeah, I can. Um, <clears throat> this fellow, uh, Eli, is an assassin for hire. He has a very checkered, difficult past, and um, he's uh, contacted by somebody in the Odessa Mafia. That, that's the Russian group in Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. And they want him to two, do two jobs. And uh, the payout is going to be a million bucks. Not that he needs the money, but uh, it sounds intriguing. I'm not going to tell you what the jobs were. One of them involves violence, and the other one involves um, manipulation. And uh, he undertakes these two jobs, and all hell breaks loose. Where the idea for that came from, I have no idea. If I knew, I'd go. <laughs> So um, let's talk about the relationship with, uh, authors have off to their work being adapted to television and film. Uh, and I think you might be going through that process yourself. Well, hopefully. Um, Michael Connolly got very involved in the Bosch series on Amazon. Don Winslow's uh, uh, book, the latest one, the, the Force, no, it's his next to latest one, got picked up and it's being directed by James Mangold. And um, uh, the border is also being turned into a film, and um, it's I, it, it's very it, actually the first uh, Don was having a lot of problems uh, writing uh, his books weren't selling, and then when uh, the death and life of Bobby Z got picked up and made into a movie, it gave him financial freedom, and he was able to. Uh, to write full time. Before that, he worked as a private investigator. He worked as a safari guide uh, on uh, photographic safaris. He worked in China. He worked as a director of uh, Shakespearean plays in London. Uh, he, he had about 10 different jobs. And- um, I love that David Mamet used to lay saw. He, he, <laughs> David Mamet said, I, 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 I'm thankful for my gift. I, I used to lay sod for a living and I didn't like it at all. <laughs> and he's done a lot of films. Uh, oh, oh he, directed. he, he, he directed and also uh, has done the screenplays. He did the screenplay for um, um, Wag the Dog. And... Uh, Wag the Dog and uh, The Untouchables. Right. And uh, he's doing the screenplay for um, The Force for, for Don Winslow's book. Uh, he's a very accomplished uh, screenplay writer. Um, but there's some authors that do not have a great rapport with uh, Hollywood and have actually stepped away from that. Sue Grafton was one. She worked in Hollywood for years and she hated it. She said, I can't stand writing by committee. Mm -hmm. And she felt uh, she would never. I, I said, uh, would you like to see Kinsey Malone uh, on the big screen? She said, I would never hand Kinsey over to them ever, never. And uh, of course, Sue Grafton died uh, about two years ago, but um, she, and she never got to Z. She was gonna write the alphabet series up to Z. And then she said, um, I forget what she said, uh, the words, uh, oh, then I'll stop or then I'll toss it in or something like that. I said, do you mean you retire? And she said, well, no, I'll go on to, I thought I was thinking of going on to numbers, but uh, that's, that's, that's <laughs> infinite. You can never end. So I can't do that. So. She was fun too. So uh, a lot of authors were inspired by other writers. Um, yes, yes. Let's talk about that and also about who inspires you. Um, who inspired? Um, the name that was brought up very frequently, there were a few names that came up all the time. Because uh, one of the questions I asked these people, uh, who do you read now? And who did you read when you were younger? Um, David Penn Warren was a favorite of uh, Andy Gross. Um, uh, Hemingway kept coming up and Mark Twain and Dickens kept coming up. Although I tried reading Dickens a few years ago, I found it so dated that I, I, I just, 
couldn't I, I, I couldn't get into it. I, Raymond it just, Chandler. Okay. Raymond Chandler. Oh, Raymond Chandler uh, influenced um, uh, Michael Connolly immensely. Uh, I, I should tell you how Michael Connolly got into crime writing, uh, how Bosch got born. Uh, Michael Connolly was driving uh, his beat up Volkswagen from his job as being a dishwasher uh, one evening. And he sees a guy, a big fat guy with a big unruly beard. And the guy takes a shirt and throws it into a hedge. So Michael, he was waiting at a red light. He makes a U-turn. He goes to the shed and he pulls out the shirt. And inside the shirt, there's a pistol. And then suddenly light bars are flashing <laughs> and the cops come and everything. And it turns out that this guy had just attempted a uh, carjacking and had shot the driver <clears throat> of the car. So... Michael called his father and his father, because he was a minor at the time, and his father, they, uh, the, the detectives take him into this bar that Michael saw this big guy with the beard run into, and there were like 50 guys there, all of them bikers with tattoos <laughs> and beards and big bellies and this and that, and they took him all down to the police precinct, and they had multiple lineups, and Michael couldn't identify the guy. For certain, he went out the back door. At least that was what my and, and the detective really came down on Michael because he thought that he was just a scared 14, 15 year old kid who didn't want to ID the mm -hmm. perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And that got Michael to reading Raymond Chandler and, and all the crime writers of the time. And Michael is now in his mid 60s. So, you know, just to put it in, in a time frame. And that's what got him interested in crime. And uh, first he read cozy mysteries and they decided that they were, they were too gentle and he wanted the rougher stuff. So he began reading uh, that and he, and I also asked him what, what made you pick the uh, name Hieronymus? He said, mm -hmm. well, in college, he took an art history class and Hieronymus uh, uh, Bosch oh, was, yeah. was uh, studied, he found his paintings filled with evil and with horror and all that. So he'd, he'd have his protagonist go through evil the way Bosch did his painting. So you, you learn so much about these people uh, when you just let them talk. And um, a lot is, a lot with thrillers and suspense is really in the first page or two. Do you want to talk about the, the hook? The hook. The, the hook is very important in this kind of a, uh, of a novel. If you don't have the hook, uh, the first sentence or paragraph, or certainly the first page or two, at, at, that's being very liberal, um, you want to grab the reader. You want the reader to say, whoa, I'm strapping myself in for the ride because this is going to be a roller coaster. I can tell right at the outset that this, this book is going to be a thriller. It's going to involve danger, mystery, suspense, and I don't know where it's going to be going. And I'm going to either get scared or, or whatever. It's going to do things to me. You think about it. There are only 26 letters in the alphabet and a writer has to take those letters and put them down on paper or on a computer screen and, by virtue of those letters, the writer has to evoke in the reader. It, it's a participatory thing. The, the reader has evoked in him or her sights, sounds, appearances, smells, action. It all has to, and, and, and that has to be presaged in the first page or two, at least in a suspense thriller. You don't have the latitude of a literary novel where you can spend Long time, just getting into a scene. <laughs> on, on the vase of flowers on the table. <laughs> As Ian Rankin says, literary writers, they can take 10 years to write a novel. Right. We thriller writers, we usually write one or two a year. Right. It's, in it's some a, cases, four. Yeah. In some cases, four. It, it's, it's, it's a not... Uh, the other thing that, that comes out in these interviews um, is how they feel about being labeled as genre writers. Which and, and again, there are subgenres. Uh, you know, the, there's the, the romance, there's a, a, a urban, suburban, noir. Um, a lot of them. Uh, Don Winslow says, you know, we're genre writers. There's this, a little bit of a stink attached to us because of that. <laughs> he has a way with words. Um, he once described the guy uh, who was morbidly obese. He said he's one jelly donut away from a triple from a uh, triple bypass, <laughs> uh, or he described a very high structure as being Carl Sagan high. 
<laughs> I mean, he, his, he, it's, it's poetry. And he, he attributes that, by the way, to having uh, directed Shakespearean plays, where, as he described, there's a musicality to the words. And I think writing and music do, do share some commonalities. Well, that's why often reading things out loud, you can, it, it's very important in the revising process. That, that's another rule that I learned, not a rule really, but it, it's worthwhile if you're going over your novel, read the dialogue out loud to yourself. See if it sounds real. As um, a very famous writer, uh, Elmore Leonard said, if it sounds like writing, rewrite it. <laughs> He also said, I leave out the parts that people skip over. <laughs> he does. He yes, really he does. does. He writes the sparsest, <laughs> yeah. most economical novels. Well, you, you can almost, if, if, if your eye flicks away for a second or two, you've missed something yeah. that's very important in the plot line. And very colorful too. Oh, like yeah, very yeah, vivid. The, yeah. the characters are so yeah. vivid. I uh, can really see them. Um, that brings me to the point about uh, plotting. Like some pe people fly by the seat of their pants and other people are very uh, rigid in how they uh, mm -hmm. plot their, their novels. So let's talk about- Well, what Catherine Coulter said, you know, there are plotters and there are pantsers. I said, I've heard of plotters, but uh, people who write, you know, they make out a, a, an elaborate pl a plot. What's a pantser? She said, that's a writer who flies by the seat of his pants. <laughs> She had a great sense of humor. She really, uh, quite a character. She says, I love writing because it gives me so much freedom. If I have a jerk for a boss, I'm the jerk. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, plotting, uh, there's all, Harlan Coben says, I, I know where a novel's gonna begin and I know where it's gonna end, but I don't know a thing about the, the, the journey. Speaking of journeys, Dennis Lehane says, a novel is really a journey, the plot, is what carries the protagonist along that journey. And you want that journey to be something in which the protagonist changes or grows or evolves in some way. And that can apply to any novel, whether it's literary or suspense or romance or whatever. But getting back to the idea that Harlan Coben said uh, about plotting, he says, I know where it's gonna begin. I know where it's gonna end. I don't know. It's, it's, he said, it's, it's the same as if I'm going from my home in New Jersey and I wanna go to, um, to, to um, California. I can take Route 80, which is the most direct way to get there, or I can go via the Suez Canal and end up later in the same place. Mm -hmm. So uh, plotting is, uh, many writers are hybrid uh, writers in terms of that. They may have a vague notion of where it's going. They may not uh, the thing to keep in mind is that a novel tends to grow organically as, as you're writing, you get new ideas. And sometimes you have to go back from page 130 to page 30, because what you wrote on page 130 really goes well and it, 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 it fits with the story. But what's on page 30 is, is, is uh, doesn't go. You've got to eliminate that or right. change it. You've got to modify it. Or so, the characters may have done something and taken it in a different direction that the author wasn't expecting. Absolutely. And you've got to adapt. Yeah. So. That, that's why some writers will tell you that the, the, the protagonist has a mind of his or her own. That, uh, and this is where Sue Grafton brings in the notion of shadow. And other writers talk about the, they always say subconscious, the psychiatrist would say unconscious, but right. it doesn't matter. It's the same phenomenon. And um, um, uh, Tess Gerritsen will sometimes wake up in the middle of the night with an idea that came from a dream that she yeah. just recalls a fragment of the dream and she'll run into the bathroom and write it down. Well, I think I'd like to open it up to the audience because I'm sure you uh, both here and at home, um, we, uh, we can take questions here. Um, so does anybody have uh, a question um, for Mark? That's what I always love when there are no questions. <laughs> no, Mike. I'll be glad to start it off. Um, you mentioned a lot of the famous writers. Here, Mike, here, just take oh. the... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. The microphone. Hi. I'm a native Chicagoan, and I liked uh, Sarah Paretsky's first novel that she wrote in about 87 or so. Mm -hmm. And we, my wife and I both, we've read everything by her ever since, including the latest one that was set, I think, in Kansas. So would you talk about Sarah a little bit and, you know, your interview with her and what made her special? 
she uh, for for Sarah, uh, she loves Chicago. Uh, she says that Chicago is is really where she uh, came into being, so to speak, where she grew up. Um, Chicago is really a character in her novels. Um, she worries about every novel she writes that it, uh, she says when I uh, you can you can hear the and and smell the rubber burning when I'm uh, working on a novel. Uh, I don't know if I'm getting it right. She worries herself, as she said, sickly pale like Hamlet uh, <laughs> when she's writing a novel. She doesn't know if anybody will ever like it. So, you know, you may be one of those that she's frightened of. Um, um, uh, she was a she's a very gracious and elegant woman, uh, very kindly, and is the uh, the, the president of the um, Mystery Writers of America. Has a very uh, feminist kind of uh, uh, outlook on life. And when she first began writing about V. I. Warshawski, um, there were no women detectives to speak of, and and she made a hard boiled, tough as nails woman detective. And um, I, I guess it's paid off for her. She's been on the bestseller list. Um, I, I've only read two or three of her novels, so I really can't comment on you know on the longitudinal uh, uh, the way the way things have panned out for uh, her. Is, but you know we're we're each entitled to our own opinions. Um, what else can I say? Thank you. And there was a question over here. Uh, they're going to bring the microphone up for you. Um, Mark, in your book, you ask many of the authors uh, if they had uh, if they had a dinner party, who were the five people they would invite. So I'm going to ask you if you had a dinner party, who were the five people you would invite? Uh, Living or dead, historical character or real life person. Okay, I'll, I'm, I'll, I'm just going to repeat that for the people at home. Uh, one of the questions Harlan asks uh, in uh, of other authors are the, who are the five people living or dead you would invite to a dinner party and the tables have been turned, sir. Yes, they have, yeah. <laughs> well, if I exclude my wife, my uh, father and mother-in-law and my own father and mother, because they are the ones I would most love to have dinner with, I would have to confess that the people I would love to have dinner with are people I've already had dinner with. Um, uh, Simon Toyne, John Land, Don Winslow, and, and his lovely wife, uh, Jean, and uh, David Morell. The fantastic people, uh, wonderful dinner conversations about writing, about other things as well. Politics, of course, and you know what's going on in the country. Um, those are the people I'd love to, uh, in terms of historical characters or people who are dead. I mean, I'd love to see Philip Roth and Gloria Steinem go at it, you know. <laughs> um, you might not even make it to the main course. No, yeah. no. And uh, Edgar Allan Poe might be interesting, but he'd get drunk, I think. Or um, And um, I, I really can't think of anybody else, but that, that would round it out a bit, I think. I'd love Frank McCourt, because uh, I, I saw McCourt, him yeah. speak and... Oh my God, he was so funny and charming. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe Maya Angelou for the same reason. She's also wise and wonderful. And uh, I think Pierre Trudeau, I'm Canadian. So Justin's father, very hot in his own way and very intellectual. <laughs> very, very. Uh, my first crush when I was eight. So um, do we have other, other questions here? Is there a question, any questions online? We do. Okay. Do any of the writers use a program to record the stories and as they record them, they are turned into print on the screen? And if so, would you know what program or app that author used? I don't know of anyone who writes that way by dictating and then uh, transferring it, uh, you know, or editing it. No, they all, I, I think the only one who writes in longhand, by the way, is Daniel Silva. He feels that he gets a closer connection from his brain through his fingers onto the legal pad. He says the end of a novel, he has a stack of legal pads that's just incredible. He transfers it over onto the computer eventually so he can get it off to the editor. But um, I don't know anybody, uh, everybody else really writes at a keyboard and computer. And of course, with your iPhone, you can record when you have those brilliant moments, um, <laughs> you can record on that. I think there was, there used to be a program called Dragon, but I don't, I think that was old, old, old. Question over here. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Oh. Yes. Um, yeah, I have a quick question about uh, kind of methodologies. I guess kind of like a more structured outline type writer, and then you, you refer to them as like kind of pantsers or plotters or pantsers. Plotter. Yeah. yeah. So your question I've, is I've heard, outlines. Well, I've heard I've heard it referred to as gardening, and I've you know to compare and contrast two authors, Stephen King is probably one of the most prolific mm -hmm. in terms of volume writing is this incredible and it's span. But then you have, and this is way before Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire with George R. 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 Martin. It's supposed to be a trilogy. Now, you know, it's what? Um, 10 years, 10 years. Uh, we've been waiting for wins and winners. So that turned out, now it's supposed to be seven books and we're only five deep. So it's like, does gardening eventually get out of control? If like, you know, the beginning and the end, you can just wind up all over. So the, so the question has to do, for those of you at home, about uh, outlines and the concept of gardening. Yeah, um, I've heard it referred to as gardening. Have I you, kinda, have you heard, heard of that? I've never, I've heard, never heard, heard of that. Of that. No, yeah. never heard of that. Uh, but let's talk about outlines, uh, because a number of authors do use mm -hmm. very um, you know, structured outlines. Yeah, some do. Uh, most uh, make a, a very modest outline. They, uh, uh, Harlan Coben will occasionally uh, outline one or two chapters ahead so that he knows now where he's going for the next two chapters. But after that, it's again, it's a mystery. Um, there's no one right way to do it. There's no uh, best way to do it. Uh, people have to, I guess it's like almost everything else. You have to do uh, do it in the way that you're comfortable with it. Right. Uh, I've never used an outline. I have Instead, I've typed out maybe 13 or 14 pages, single spaced of just ideas mm -hmm. and of some plot points, but I wouldn't uh, go so far as to call that an outline. And then at the end of the novel, I'll look at what I had so-called plot it's points. All in there. It, 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 no, it's, it, it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't even resemble what I put down. It's, but it, it's, it, pumped the, it pumped the engine. It got it got the engine started. Yeah, yeah. it primed the pump. Yeah. Primed, the, primed the pump. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, there was a question over here somewhere. I thought, did I not see a raised hand? Oh, back here, sir. Yes. Okay. Hi. Thank you for mentioning Poe, who happens to be my all-time favorite. One of mine, also. Yeah, incredible. And we talked about the original mystery thriller, or whatever. He invented the detective story. Yeah. It, it, unbelievable. Question for you. As a reader, it's important for me to be able to identify with the protagonists. There are three that I identify with and they're not at all right, which I find is, I think about that often, Gabriel Oran, Aloysius Pendergast, and Stone Barrington. Mm -hmm. They could not be any more different, but I love reading and pretending I'm any of them. There's no Jack Reacher there? Well, Jack, which rap? Okay. Yeah. It's um, so as an author, what are the tricks for getting your reader to identify with your protagonists or all the tricks of doing so? Okay. The question is as a, as a writer, um, what are the tricks that writers use to help their readers identify with the characters? I think the simple answer is really that I write for myself, what I think and feel and, and what I can imagine. And I don't worry about what the reader or a reader or some idealized reader may identify with or like or dislike. I may later on when I'm editing saying, well, gee, that's too offensive or you know, there are too many curse words in this particular passage and uh, it could turn some people off, um, especially people on Goodreads, you know? <laughs> so- um, You speak from experience? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, my first novel, there was a lot of cursing in there. Um, um, so so th there, there's no one way to, uh, to formulate that. I mean, uh, uh, People, I, I think if you touch the human core of life, of living, uh, of fear, of rage, of envy, of love, they say, write what you know. As a human being, you know what it is to feel envy, anger. You know what it is to feel lonely, to feel elated, to feel sad, even depressed. 
if you can touch those touchstones, if you can bring them out from your own inner being, most people are gonna be able to relate to that if they like to read the genre in which you write. And also didn't a lot of the authors talk about the importance of making all the characters, uh, you know, human having f- human flaws and likable yes. qualities and not so, so even the villains to make them more accessible um, or for people to identify with them that. C.J. Box, known yeah. as Chuck Box, he, he talks about uh, Joe Pickett being a very flawed guy. Uh, uh, he's grown and changed and gotten a little harder over the years um, because they're 23 novels down and he ages in one year. Uh, each each year he grows older. Some some authors, like particularly John Sanford, keeps his uh, protagonist in his fifties. He's been doing that for twenty three years. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there too, we're all flawed people, and if your protagonist has a flaw, that makes the protagonist more relatable. And uh, sometimes a reader could say, well, "You're so stupid. Why do you do something so stupid like that?" But uh, we all do stupid things. But then you look at a character like Hannibal Lecter, oh, well, and it, he can be so charming and, and uh, you know, elegant. And then it, it, you kind of get sucked in and then he'll do something that just takes your yes. breath away. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you know, there are people who are duplicitous like that, too. You know, <laughs> indeed. Uh, any more questions online? Yes. Yes. This one is about um, putting the book together as an anthology. The authors are from different publishers. How did you get everyone to agree? Did anyone say, no, they didn't want to do it? Was there anybody you wanted to get that you couldn't? Oh, they want dirt is what I think this. Yeah. Um, as far as getting the authors, uh, it, it really happened uh, in a way, sir, uh, uh, sir, in a serendipitous fashion. Um, I began doing a blog for the Huffington Post and many of the things I was writing uh, were just my own thoughts about writing or about experiencing certain things in life. And then I had the opportunity uh, through a publicist who called me and said, would you like to interview Andrew Gross? And I said, yes, sure. That would, and she said, you know, that would be for the Huffington Post. So I interviewed him and I, uh, Linda cleaned it up and uh, it got published. In <laughs> Thank the you, Huff- Linda. It got published in the Huffington Post. And then the same publicist called me from the same publishing company. Would you like to interview Steve Berry, who writes historical thrillers? Oh, that's another genre, subgenre, historical thrillers. I said, yeah, sure. So I interviewed Steve Berry and that too got published. And before I knew it, Publishers from every single house around were sending me advanced readers' copies, ARCs, ARCs. Uh, I was getting 10 or 12 of them a week, Wait. and I, <laughs> I couldn't keep up with that. So I got to pick, and I picked out uh, over the course of five years, I think I probably interviewed about 200 uh, different authors, or no, 200 authors, some, some of them three, four, and even five times. But uh, there were at least 150, 160 authors who I interviewed, and I did about 325 pieces for the Huffington Post. And, you know, when you have the imprimatur of a publication behind you, it's not me they were really contacting. They wanted uh, these publishing houses wanted uh, their authors to be featured in the Huffington Post, which had millions of readers. So that's how it came to being. Uh, There was no competition between and among um, uh, publishers or authors. Um, um, in one or two cases, an author referred me to a, another author. I, uh, there was nobody that I really sought to get that I, and I, I didn't really seek anybody out. The publishing houses sought me out to interview their authors. I had thought when I was finally putting the book together, I thought about possibly getting Stephen King but he's very difficult to get. He really uh, doesn't give out, uh, doesn't do interviews for the most part. Um, And he really uh, doesn't, except for Mr. Mercedes, he doesn't write suspense thrillers. He writes more horror and and other things. So I didn't want to do, uh, I didn't want to get involved with David Baldacci or or James Patterson because they don't write their own books anymore. And, and so it was a pretty easy thing. Which leads me to perfect segue, Mark. Thank you. 
uh, how do you feel about authors? Um, and this person referenced Jack Reacher franchise from Lee Child to his nephew now writing them. Or if an author um, passes away, uh, there someone else picks up the series and writes under a different name or you know, like you say, Bill Dodge and others have a whole franchise of people writing in there. That's name. happening more and more now. Um, uh, Jesse Stone has been picked up by Ace Atkins. Um, uh, the Parker novels have been picked up by um, Reed Farrell Coleman. Uh, Lee, uh, Lee Child has retired and his brother, um, uh, Preston, is, is continuing on with the Jack Reacher series. Um, I remember asking uh, Reed Farrell Coleman what it was like to try and uh, pick up on somebody who had died and, and continue on with the series. And he talked about the difficulties and, and uh, he, he made an interesting, uh, he said, I, I don't try to mimic or imitate what uh, Parker did. He said, for me to try to do that, he said, I, he called up a friend who said, you know, I've been to Las Vegas and I've seen all the Elvis imitators, and some of them are absolutely fantastic, but in the end, you know they're imitating. They're not the genuine thing. So be your own self, do your own take on Parker or Jesse Stone, and that's what they've done. Uh, what Preston Child is gonna do with uh, Lee Child's Jack Reacher, who knows? Jack Reacher, by the way, is, is not gonna be another, there's not gonna be another Reacher movie, it's gonna be a television series. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Uh, if you had to spend a <clears throat> couple of weeks on a desert island, which two or three thrillers would you take to reread? Oh boy! Oh, to reread. To reread. Okay. Which, uh, if if Mark was on a desert island and he had uh, could take two uh, novels with him or thrillers with him, which two would he take to reread? When it comes to novels, just in general, I would take uh, Philip Roth's American Pastoral. Okay, I, to me, that's one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. Uh, as far as thrillers are concerned, I would take Don Winslow's Savages, which is a unique, artfully written, relatively short novel, maybe 220 pages. Uh, it is just an astounding uh, display of uh, uh, literary, uh, of uh, suspense-filled high-wire act. Um, I might also want to take uh, Scott Turo's Presumed Innocent. I did a lot of forensic work as a psychiatrist. I testified frequently in court, so I have a lot of experience with courtrooms. And I think Scott Turo captured the courtroom so fantastically in um, Presumed Innocent. Uh, any others I, I would... Uh, Reed Farrell Coleman is a is he's called the the uh, the poet noir laureate of suspense <laughs> thriller writers. He writes very noirish stuff in a sort of literary style that's difficult to put down for me at least. And I, I might take one of his books. There's one. Um, it's called What You Break. It's the first uh, Gus Murphy novel in a new series he began, and uh, it begins with Gus Murphy. He's divorced. His son has died from a sudden cardiac event on a basketball court. And uh, he uh, has a bad leg and he had to retire from the Suffolk County Police Force. And he has a job riding a, 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 a driving a limo for a, a, a seedy hotel, taking ferrying guests back and forth to and from the airport. And I asked him, why would you, what made you pick such a dark place to begin uh, a protagonist's life on. He said, well, it opens up the doors for so much. Mm -hmm. So I, I would take one of his books along, I think. But I wouldn't want to be on a desert island without my island without my wife. <laughs> uh, one more question. I think we're going to end on this one because we want to save time for um, uh, for signing the, yep. the books and signing. So we have one more online question, and I think it's a good wrap up. What do you think is the core indispensable ingredient in all thrillers? Wow, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> the core indispensable ingredient in all thrillers is suspense. Okay. It's uh, what happens next. What's going to happen 
to the protagonist or his loved ones. That's it. I mean, that's what keeps people turning pages. What, what, what where's this going? What's going to happen? I, that's the way I like I when they have the up. short chapters that they keep you on the edge of your well, seat. Well, that's one of and Patterson's so... uh, rules. Keep, keep the chapters short, short, keep them going. Right. And, you know, you come to at the end of a four page chapter. Well, big deal. I can, I'll do another I can read three, another one. Yeah. 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 And yeah. then it's three o'clock in the morning. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, I can't thank you enough, Mark. Um, this is, as I say, I'm going to keep this book uh, near nearby because I'm going to use it as, uh, you know, sort of a compendium to whatever I, I'm in the mood for. There's 46 okay. great authors in there um, and some wonderful questions <laughs> and some great editing. So uh, Mark has this book and some of your other books as well back there. No, or just, just primarily just the one. this one. I okay, think. the yeah. storytellers yeah. is in the back, and Mark yeah. will be signing and uh, selling yeah. some books that help the library. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Mark and Megan, for such an engaging thank conversation. They, I just want to say that, you know, it, it, it was just a wonderful conversation hearing about these storytellers and both of you are really kept us so engaged. Uh, the insights provided by this book, I think, is truly a gift to aspiring writers, Mark. Um, you know, it's filled with these nuggets of history and background influences and revelations, which I think is not only beneficial to aspiring writers, but as you know, uh, an English major, you love stuff like this because it gives you an insight into maybe um, what you know generated some of those things. Mm -hmm. And lastly, I want to say is that um, you know some of the wonderful things that we've heard about previous writers, and one comes to mind is Ernest Hemingway, mm -hmm. and um, some of. Um, the most uh, insightful things that we learned about him came from interviews. So I think this is a lasting um, resource for people because in years to come, these little nuggets will definitely help. So thank you for your contributions. And thanks again to everyone for joining us this evening. Have a good evening. Oh, nice to have a thank full you. house. Thank you.